Hey, WSBC, thanks for streaming with us and worshiping uh, with us as a church this morning. We're glad that you're here. And as we continue to worship, just a couple of things that we want to let you know about um, in the life of our church. The first is that on June 7th at 11 a.m., our second stay-at-home communion service is going to be made available. Um, So just like last time, get your own elements beforehand. There will be a link in the church email whereby if you click it, it will take you at 11 a.m. or any other time on that Sunday uh, to a YouTube video, a private YouTube video of that communion service. And then same thing on our WSBC Facebook page. If you follow it at 11 a.m., that same communion video will be made available. We hope that this is something encouraging for you and your family whoever you're with, um, and we want you to know that uh, we'll be doing this act of worship as united and bound to and in the Holy Spirit as we ever have. Um, So that's the first thing, communion service, June 7th. The video will be made available at 11 a.m. The second thing is that we just want to congratulate our seniors um, at WSBC. I know today, Um, There is going to be some semblance of a graduation ceremony going on at LT, uh, wherein most of our seniors are uh, at WSBC Go. But then all around the western suburbs, there are other schools that will be sending off seniors that are represented by our youth group here at WSBC. And we just want to say that we love you, we're grateful for you, we're thankful for you. And I also want to encourage you as the rest of the church to be praying for our seniors, not because the next step of life for them is big and scary, um, but mostly because they're important to us as real and vital members of this body. Um, And their growth and um, maturity in the gospel means our own health in the gospel as well. And so continue to pray for them. And if you need a list of names, then in the church email, Uh, There should be a link there for our HSM senior page. Um, And that's just a page on our website with pictures, names of seniors, the schools that they're graduating from, ways to pray for them, addresses to send letters, and uh, much more. Or not much more, just a little bit more than that. Um, So check that link out and uh, pray for our seniors, encourage them with a note. But to our seniors, we just want to say, that we're grateful for you, we love you, we're so excited to see how you represent us and Jesus in the stages of life that are uh, near to come. And if you are moving out uh, this fall, we hope that you do come and worship and hang out with us when you're back at home. So as we continue to worship, here's a word from the Lord from Revelation chapter 15. This is from verses 3 and 4. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. It is true that one day all nations and all peoples will come and gather and worship our King Jesus. Um, And this weekly rhythm of worshiping on Sundays is mere preparation for that day. Preparation of our hearts and souls and bodies in this community um, to be holy unto the Lord. So let's continue to worship him so that he might prepare us for that eternal day when we're continually nourished in his presence um, and worshiping in his glory. Where death would die. 
Western Springs Baptist Church, it's good to be with you. Um, in a moment, we'll pray together 
Uh, But before we do, I confess that when I read these verses from the book of James, it caught me up short. And I think you'll understand why. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, uh, when you meet trials of various kinds, uh, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, uh, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If you If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters. Even in these days, even in the days of a pandemic, even in these days of inconvenience when we are limited in our travels and our goings and limited in our perhaps even in our breathing through masks when we are inconvenienced by so many things, thought-wise, emotionally, socially, physically, financially. It's all been affected, and it all will change how we live our lives, won't it? We acknowledge that. And yet, if we are in Christ, if we are believers in Jesus, consider it all joy because in this trial— Our faith is being steadfast, and it is being firm foundation for us in which we can live our lives and live out our faith um, so that we can become fully mature. So let's let this passage shape our prayer this morning together as a congregation of believers in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, we do come before you and we confess our shortcomings we confess that we, we lose our temper or we allow our lips to say unclean and harmful things. We confess that our hearts um, are impatient and we feel the strain and tension around us as we hear the news and live our life and try to find a new way of living in this day. Lord, we confess that there is much in this world that is not right. And in that truth, we recognize that what is not right in this world can be made right through your Son, Jesus Christ. And and in that truth, we find our peace and our hope and our love for you and for one another. So Lord, in this moment, as we are worshiping and praying together as your people, may our minds be unified and our hearts be bound together in love and truth. May we be your people who will not look to our own interests to be served, but to serve the interests of others as Paul put it in Philippians 2, verse 4. Father, you know our needs. You know that we need your care for us emotionally and mentally. We need our minds to be fixed on you, to look only to Jesus in our darkest moments. You know that we have needs physically and emotionally and financially, and socially. Lord, even, even this weekend, Illinois is opening and re- relinquishing some of the restrictions, um, and yet we still feel, we feel the tension of being restricted. And so, God, even in that, would we look to you and your son, Jesus, because ultimately we recognize that and that our life and our new way of living is to be lived out in faith in Jesus Christ. Because He lives, we can face tomorrow. All of our fears can be set aside because Jesus lives. And in Jesus and because He lives, 
we live. We live in joy in the moment. We live in wisdom because we so desperately need you to flood us with your wisdom as we make decisions about our life today and tomorrow and the next day. And we live our life in faith, boldly proclaiming the gospel that Jesus Christ lives today and tomorrow and forevermore. For we pray in his powerful, precious, holy name. Amen. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to
It is always a great privilege for me to take us to the Word of God to find out what God has for us. But before we do that, let's just ask Him to help us this morning as we come to His Word. Heavenly Father, in Your presence, You teach us, so we would now gather and be submissive to You in Your presence so that You might teach us from Your Word. Lord, help us to learn how to be followers followers of you, our great God and uh, our Savior. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we move to begin a new series found in the New Testament. In the next weeks through the summer, we'll be in the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm beginning with Matthew chapter 8 this morning, verses 1 through 22. So let me read the text as we begin this morning. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I don't, do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would, and his servant was healed at that moment. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out all the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. As we begin this series in the Gospel of Matthew, my goal is very simple, that you and that I would get to know Jesus better. I think it is possible to sit in church regularly and to miss a warm personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and yet that is the most important thing. The gospel is clear that because I am a sinner, I am alienated from God in my rebellion against him. 
But Jesus Christ came. He came for me. He came to die on the cross for my sins so that through him I might have life and a right relationship with God. He came to meet all of my needs. And as I put my faith in him, I can have a relationship with him. And he will come into my life through the power of his Holy Spirit and be there with me. And with that warm personal relationship with Christ, I find the meaning and the joy and the peace that I need. And I want to come to know him more and more. And that's my desire for you. Now, don't you wish that you could have been there during those days when Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee around Capernaum? Five years ago when I was in Israel, we went to the ruins of where the town of Capernaum was. And there's the ruins of a synagogue, probably not dating from Jesus' day. But evidence is that it's built on the place where that one would have been when Jesus was there. We saw the, the ruins are supposedly the ruins of Peter's house. There's an octagonal church built over top of it. It looked like a spaceship. And as we looked around those ruins of Capernaum and the group was headed back to our van, I went off to the Sea of Galilee, which was right there, and I just pondered for a moment, what would it have been like to be there when Jesus was walking on those shores and the crowds were gathering around him? And, Mark, and Matthew is clear in his gospel that that, that many were drawn to him. The crowds were great. They were drawn to him because of the, they had heard his teaching. In the text before us, we find that that's why they were there. The end of chapter 7, which is the, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says this, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds were following him. His teaching was authoritative. It was engaging. It was surprising. It was life-changing. It told them how to live. And they believed he was a good teacher. And, and they were drawn to him because of that. And many are today drawn to him because he's a good teacher. He teaches such wonderful things. But it was more than the teaching. I think they were drawn to him because they experienced his compassion Another summary of Jesus' teaching is found in, in Matthew chapter 4, the end of that chapter. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. They came because they, they saw that he cared about people. And he reached out and he touched them and, and he healed them. He was a, a man of love and compassion. And in the text before us this, this morning, there are three miracles of healing. And I think the significance of these three coming together is these miracles take place to those who are marginalized by society. Jesus in this text comes to a leper and a Gentile and a woman, the outcasts. The leper was bodily unclean. Uh, the, the Gentile, because of his race or nationality, he was not a Jew. And, and because of her gender, the, the woman was marginalized in society. And, and it is true that the disadvantaged more often received the blessing from Jesus it could be because they were humble enough to come, they were aware of their needs, but beyond that, Jesus cares about those who are marginalized. He cares about those who are on the outside. Jesus is, is a man of love. He touches the leper. He commends the Gentile. He heals the woman because he's a man of love. And people are drawn to that. But also people in that day saw his power. The miracles that he did that we've read about were not done in a corner. People came to him because they believed he had the power to heal. And in a world where there was so much sickness and so much sorrow, the evidence was clear and so they came. And with a touch or with a word, he rebuked the demons and healing took place. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus could walk around our world right now and just touch those who now have the coronavirus and bring healing? Uh, we, we would have been drawn to be with that crowd. I think our curiosity alone would have, 
would have had us joining that, that curious crowd around Jesus in those early days. But I want us to note from this text that not all those in the curious crowds became faithful followers of Jesus. In verse 18, he gives the order to cross the lake. Why? Well, it says when he saw the crowds, he gave that order. The idea, I think, was who, who will get in the boat with me? Who will really be my followers? And notice only a few get in the boat. Would I have gotten in the boat? Would you have gotten in the boat? And so I ask myself the question, am I willing to step out of the curious crowd to join the faithful followers of Jesus and in the text before us, we, we learn a little bit of the characteristics of those who do step out of the curious crowd to be with the few faithful followers. Jesus, uh, Matthew tells us about these few and, and some of the individuals from the text teach us about those who will be Jesus' followers. And I notice, first of all, the, the few faithful followers come to Jesus with humility. The first individual in our text is a leper. Certainly he was one who had socially out, was socially outcast. There was a stigma with that disease that he could not get away from. He had to live in a colony and, and he had to cry, unclean, unclean. Of the 61 defilements of ancient Judaism, the thing that would make you unclean, second only to a dead body in seriousness is the idea of touching a leper. And in his book, Unclean, Unclean S. L. S. Husinga describes some of the horrors of leprosy. He writes, the disease which we today call leprosy generally begins with a pain in a certain area of the body. Numbness follows. Soon the skin in such spots loses its original color. It gets to be a thick, glossy, and scaly skin. As the, as the sickness progresses, the, the thickening spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to poor blood supply. The skin, especially around the eyes and ears, begins to bunch with deep furrows between the swellings so that the face of the afflicted individual begins to resemble that of a lion. Fingers drop off or are absorbed. Toes are afflicted similarly. Eyebrows and eyelashes drop out. By this time, one can see that this person in this pitiful condition is a leper. And then one can even smell it, for the leper emits a very unpleasant odor. Moreover, in view of the fact that the disease-producing agent frequently also attacks the larynx, the leopard's voice acquires a grating quality. His throat becomes hoarse, and, and you can not only see it, but you can smell that he's a leopard and you can hear it in his rasping voice. It's no wonder that the Talmud forgave, forbade a Jew from coming nearer to a leper than six feet. Interesting, isn't it? The social distancing they knew then already. Or even within 150 feet if the wind was blowing, how, how far would the air take the, the, the germ? And, and so the leper was ostracized from society. But this particular leper came to Jesus. Not sure how he got there, but he comes humbly. He knows he has a need. And he kneels down before Jesus with great respect and homage. And he says, Lord, it is a confession of faith in Jesus. It's the kind of title you would give to a deity or to a king. I don't know what he believed about Jesus' deity, but I believe at this point he knew or believed that he was God's Messiah. Because healing leprosy was the sign of the Messiah, and the leper clearly believed that Jesus could heal him. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus has the power. The only question is, would he be willing to do it? Uh, when we pray for people's healing, it's best if we keep that same idea in mind. Jesus has the power. The question is, is, is he willing? And, and, and notice Jesus' amazing response. He reaches out and touches this one who is unclean. No one is unclean to Jesus. I wonder how long it had been since he had been touched. Max Locato 
makes this a, a personal thing as he tells the story. And he says, I, I wonder if his story went something like this. For five years, no one touched me, not my wife, not my child, not my friends. They saw me, they spoke to me. I sensed love in their voices. I saw concern in their eyes, but I didn't feel their touch. There was no touch, not once. What is common to you? I coveted handshakes, warm embraces, a tap on the shoulder to get my attention. We can relate, can't we? A kiss on the lips. Such moments were taken from my world. No one touched me. No one even bumped into me. Oh, what I, have, what I would have given to be bumped into, to be caught in a crowd uh, where my shoulder could brush against another's. But for five years, it has not happened. How could it have? I was not allowed on the street. Even the rabbis kept their distance from me. I was not permitted in my synagogue, not welcome in my house. I was untouchable. I was a leper and no one had touched me until today and on this day the son of god lovingly condescended to touch the outcast of outcasts jesus responded in that kind of love i want you to know that kind of jesus and i want you to know that even though you don't have leprosy leprosy is, is a picture of the defilement we have from a holy god but there is no one unclean before Jesus as he reaches out to touch. And the few faithful followers who come to Jesus come with humility. But notice this, the few faithful followers come to Jesus with faith. The second individual in our story is a centurion. He was a commander of a division of occupying Roman troops. And Jesus' ministry throughout his earthly life was confined almost exclusively to Israel, but here was a Gentile in Jewish territory, a symbol of their subjection to the Roman Empire and certainly unclean because of his race or his ethnicity, he was not a Jew. And yet the centurion comes to Jesus with faith, asking for help because he had a paralyzed servant. He calls him Pais in the Greek. It's a word that's usually translated boy or young child. John says he was his son. I don't think that's a contradiction. You see, he could have been his servant, but he had loved him so much that he, he treated him as a son. And, and you sense here the very close relationship this servant had with his master so that when the servant is ill and suffering terribly, so is the centurion himself. And Jesus' response is, well, shall I come and heal him? And the idea here is, shall I? And that's the emphasis, I, a Jew? It's almost as if he's testing him, but it indicates the situation. Are you asking me, a, a Jew, to come to your house to touch your servant? But here again is Jesus, because his implication is, I, I will come. You see, faith is a powerful thing. Martin Luther King Jr. said, faith transforms the whirlwind of despair into a warm, reviving breeze of hope. The words of a motto which a generation ago were commonly found on the walls of homes of devout persons needs to be etched on our hearts. Fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. That's the power of faith. That's the power that this centurion found. And uh, notice how his faith is shown in his response. He says to Jesus, well, you're right. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But since you can heal from a distance, just give the command. I know you have the authority. Yes, I have some authority, but Jesus, you have all the authority. And if you just give the command... And Jesus is amazed at the centurion's faith. And he teaches a lesson about discipleship. He, he looks to those following him, the crowds around. And, and he says, nowhere in Israel have I found such great faith. What does he mean? I think the quality of faith. The faith that is a singular focus on Christ. And universal in its scope. A faith that, that believes that when Jesus comes, the pathway is open to all. And he says, many will come from unexpected places, the nations, the Gentiles from the east and the west. 
I think it's a, a foretelling of what will happen in the church as people come to Jesus from all over the world and take their place with the Israelites at the Messianic banquet. They will be part of it. And, and they're not children of the kingdom by racial descent, but rather by their faith in Christ. And the centurion understood that. Yes, it is open to all, but only... But you only get in one way, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. But when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then, then you're invited into the banquet hall that's flooded with light compared to the outer darkness of those who are rejected and, and are left with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus understands the power of this man's faith. And those who follow Jesus come with that kind of faith. And, and notice in the end he says, as you believe, so let it be. And the healing occurs at a distance. The healing occurs at that very moment. The few faithful followers come to Jesus with faith. Pastor H.B. Charles tells the story about a woman who showed up at the church's prayer meeting week after week and would only pray the, the simple prayer as they went around the circle when it got to her she would say oh lord thank you jesus it happened week after week and there was almost some tittering as everybody knew exactly what she was going to say and somebody finally asked her why do you pray the same little prayer and she said well i'm just combining the two prayers that i know we live in a bad neighborhood and some nights there are bullets flying and I have to grab my daughter and hide on the floor. And in that desperate state, all I know how to crowd is, oh Lord. But when I wake up in the morning and see that we're okay, I say, thank you, Jesus. And when I take my daughter to the bus stop and she gets on that bus and I don't know what's going to happen to her while she's away, I cry, oh Lord. And when 3 p.m. comes and the bus arrives and my baby is safe, I say, thank you, Jesus. She said, those, those are the only two prayers I know. And when I get to church, I realize God has been so good to me that I just put my two prayers together. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. That's what a relationship with Jesus does. But notice thirdly in our text, the few faithful followers come to Jesus ready to serve. The third individual in our text is, is Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, Jesus comes to Peter's house and, and while he's there, he encounters this woman and, and he shows sympathy to this woman, another marginalized person in society. But gender made no difference to Jesus. Now notice that this healing is a bit different. Jesus comes to her. Well, the parallel text says that he was asked to see her by her family. But isn't it often the case that we need others to bring us to Jesus or that God needs to use you to bring others to Jesus? But when he got there, he found that she was in bed with a severe fever and it would have been a deadly thing, undoubtedly. And I love the way verses 14 and 15 put it. It's, it's almost like a, uh, an X. Uh, it starts when evening came. Uh, I'm sorry, but when Jesus came into, the, into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her. The fever left her. She got up out of bed and began to wait on him. You see, it goes from him seeing her to touching her to her ministering to him. Uh, the focus is on his touch of her. Uh, Touching a person with a fever was forbidden by rabbinic tradition. But he touched her. And in the end, the one who saw her is served by her. She got up showing the reality of the healing and the nature of her gratitude and she begins to serve Jesus. She, she crossed that line, I think, from being in the, the crowd to being one of the few faithful followers. Uh, Sam Shoemaker, who was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, said this. He said, you know uh, what a lot of religious people are like? They're like a, a lot of people sitting around in a railroad station thinking they're on a train. 
everyone is talking about travel and you hear the names of the stations and you've got your tickets and there's the smell of baggage all around you and a great deal of stir. And if you sit there long enough, you almost think you're on a train, but you're not. You only start to get converted at the point when you get on the train and get pulled out of the station and you do get pulled out. You don't walk out on your own. What he's saying there is that there comes a time when you have to get on the train and move from the, the curious crowd to be those who are the faithful followers. And I want to notice that now again the crowds gather. And the implication from the text is that the Sabbath has ended. Uh, that's made clear in the parallel text. And so now as the day ends, many were brought to be healed and in that area, almost all the sick were brought. And in fact, John MacArthur says, for this brief period of time, disease and other physical afflictions were virtually eliminated from that area. I think he's right, because Jesus healed all who came to him. But it was the crowd. And yes, prophesied that Jesus would reverse the curse according to Isaiah 53, verse 4. That's quoted in this text. And sickness is a picture of that curse. Jesus touched these lives he had the power to do it the question is would those who are touched by him now become his followers and it leads me to a fourth thing we learn from this text and that is that the few faithful followers come to Jesus ready to count the cost as the text goes on we are introduced to two would-be disciples Jesus has given the orders to cross the Sea of Galilee. To who? Well, it's an unspecified group. We don't know. Those who would be his disciples. Was it the 12? Well, they don't show up until chapter 10 in Matthew's account. It seems as if there's some winnowing going on here. Who will really follow Jesus? And the first one that steps up is, is a scribe, a teacher of the law. And he seems to be over eager. Teacher, he says, I will follow you wherever you go. He is eager, but he doesn't know what that commitment involves. And Jesus is direct, verse 20. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus says to him, do you really know what it costs? You see, I am the citizen of a new place, a new country, and and if you follow me, you're into something brand new and it will be costly. As it's costly for me, it will be costly for you. Are you ready to count the cost? You know, some of you enjoy backpacking and hiking in the wilderness areas. Uh, I, I do for a while, but not to sleep on the hard ground and all of that. But some of you really get into that. But if you're going to do that kind of thing, you have to count the cost. It's not the same, right? Uh, these are actual responses from comment cards to those uh, who had spent some time in the Bridger Wilderness area of Wyoming. There's some 600 miles of trails there, and these people were on these trails. And this is what they said. Number one, trails need to be wider so people can walk while holding hands. I imagine there was a honeymoon couple that was in there. Uh, trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. There are too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these pets. This one. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that you can get wonderful views without having to hike to them. Or this one. A McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. Or there's too many rocks in these mountains. <laughs> Let me tell you, if you're going to hike in the wilderness, on the mountains, there's, go, uh, there's going to be rocks. When you follow Jesus, there's going to be a cost to pay. Are you willing to pay the price? And another disciple shows up. He's, he's under-eager, if I could put it that way. He's ready to follow, but not yet. First, let me go and bury my father, he says. Now, was he dead, or was he simply dying? Was he old? He maybe wasn't even old, but... But, but first, he needed to do something else. And, and I think that is the key. First, something was more important. And so Jesus comes with his hard saying, verse 22, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Clearly, he couldn't want us to understand this literally because the physically dead certainly can't bury the dead. 
Was it that the spiritually dead should bury the dead? Well, I think it's simply hyperbole. But Jesus' teaching is clear, isn't it? The lesson is there are no other priorities that can come before following Jesus. This would-be disciple would not pay the price. Amy Carmichael put it this way, certain it is that the reason there is so much shallow living, so much talk but little obedience, is that so few are prepared to be like the pine on the hilltop, alone in the wind for God. So few are willing to be the faithful followers of Jesus. See, it's easy to be part of the curious crowd. Many are part of that crowd. But the question I ask myself and I ask you this morning, are you willing to join the faithful followers who will be few? Who come to Jesus with humility, who come with faith, who come ready to serve, ready to count the cost, ready to reap all of the rewards of entering into a personal, warm relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the greatest thing. And Jesus is the one who gives life and life to the full. Are you ready to follow him? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for our wonderful Savior. Help us to get to know him by drawing near, humbly, in faith, willing to serve, ready to count the cost. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace. That taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are. Unending 
shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine